viewers, once again, welcome to the show. It's the Enterprise Uganda Forum. We're talking about business, we're talking about enterprises. Once again, I'm your host, Charles Boji, and in the studio, I have our regular panelist, Charles Ochichi. Charles, it's time to be the Thank viewers. you so much, and good afternoon, viewers. Happy again to be here this Sunday. That's Charles Ochichi, the Executive Director, Enterprise Uganda. And um, as usual, and again, I'd like to insist and, and mention this again, that these forums are meant to be as practical as possible. We're not discussing <coughs> theory. We want to look at what you can do as a business person, you know, to build resilience uh, in the area or in the sector where you sit. Because we understand, Charles, that tideline, mortality rate, of mm. businesses in Uganda, businesses mm. not being able to celebrate. Is it the first, second, or third birthday? Exactly. The first and second are such a big, big area to cross. I hear you. Yeah. Now, um, today, uh, we are blessed to have a very um, rich uh, in experience, that is, uh, entrepreneur in the studio with us, who's going to share his story. And from his story, I'm sure we should be able to pick a number of things, a number of um, values and virtues to help us strengthen our positions in business, those that are already there, but then to pick a few learnings or key learnings uh, for those that are already in business. Alex, this is the time when I get to introduce to my viewers. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Thanks for your invitation. I'm humbled. Good. That's <coughs> Alex uh, from Danwell. Dry cleaners. Dry cleaners, exactly. I, you can see it looks dope. <laughs> uh, so you don't really have to ask many questions about the sector where he sits. That's the sector. Mm. Charles, um, mm. let's begin with what could have um, intrigued you this week on the mm. business or in the realm of business. This week had something interesting that I thought had never happened probably for decades in this country. And it was prompted by earlier articles that featured in the public arena about businesses that had collapsed mm. and how people were beginning to throw stones at the banks and why people were saying some of these banks are not necessarily deeply rooted in our country. Mm. And uh, if you read just those articles alone, you could probably have been persuaded. Yeah. And then something interesting came in. The executive director of the Institute of Bankers Association came in, Will mm -hmm. Broad Award, mm -hmm. and put a full one-page submission explaining how banks work, explaining how interest rates are derived, explaining how loans are granted, explaining <coughs> circumstances under which loans can become causes for receivership or liquidation of an enterprise that benefited from them. Mm. And I thought that was probably one such as press statement, material for somebody to read and keep. Whether you have borrowed or you have not borrowed, you needed that material. Mm. Very authoritative, very balanced, very useful, and I thought we need more of that conversation to take place. I agree with you, Charles, because mm. um, you see, every year, I think ever after a period of time, Bank of Uganda also publishes a list mm. which shows you, you know, the... Breakdown of interest rates. In different banks. Correct, yeah. And, and financial service providers. Now, yeah. I keep asking myself, how many business people actually... But by time yes. to go through that list. Because that should Correct. be, you know, like a compass to direct you exactly. where to get not cheap credit, but Correct. affordable credit. Exactly. Yeah. That yeah. reflects where you are. Yes. Because if you read that article from OWAR, from the history of bankers, yeah. it tells you that today you may be getting interest rates of 22%. Mm. But doesn't mean that's where you're supposed to remain. There are things you can do to mm. get yourself to 15%. Mm -hmm. But if you've been at 15%, if you don't follow certain things, you could slip back to 27%. Yeah. The ball is on the enterprise player. But you've seen people saying, oh, a new bank has arrived. Why don't I now abandon a bank I've been with for 30 years, mm -hmm. run the other side and malign and call these other banks all types of names? Yeah. Yeah. So I thought the private sector, if you miss that article, locate it again. In case you fail to get it, which I don't think you'll fail, there is the executive director of the Institute of Bankers, Will Broad or War. Mm -hmm. You can reach him. He will be able to give you that copy. It was On that note, Charles, yeah. very good, brilliant indeed. Mm. Let's go into, you know, saving what we learned last week 
we had a very uh, powerful story from yeah. uh, Santanzo. Yes. Quite powerful. I was really, really touched. And yeah. um, <laughs> I'm sure a number of our viewers must have picked a thing or two, yeah. you know, from that um, quite strong story. Very what were the key learnings that you picked for mm. purposes of our viewers, probably who missed the show? Yes. Or those who could have gotten, you know, sometimes s when someone is telling a story and it's yes. a good story, yeah. you might actually get so excited. That's the and point. And you end up uh, yes. missing some points. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Charles, and I'm happy that I'm here to balance that kind of a picture. Yes. Last week, we had uh, an industry shaper, an industry champion called Santa Azo from Arapapa. Mm -hmm. She doesn't say Arapapa, mm -hmm. Arapapa. <laughs> Arapapa fashion uh, designers had some key points that I thought were what you call cross-cutting learnings. Mm -hmm. Then I will later pick the direct les lessons that came from her. Mm -hmm. There were some three things that I thought were general cross-learnings, and I call them the headline points that came out of that story. Yeah. Number one was that even a sector leader and a pioneer needs mentorship and training in business skills. Mm. A sector leader, you mm. made it, you moved there, mm. you've shaped things so well. You need mentorship and business skills to remain in business. Passion alone is not enough. Yeah. That came out very, very key. And if somebody is seated here and you are the best in your district or wherever you are, this statement is key for you. Okay. Two, one of the most difficult traits or behaviors to retain when you are at the top of your game is investing in yourself through continuous learning mm. and taking advice. Mm. The moment you are at the top, people are glorifying you and giving you titles, chairman of the association, mm. chairman of this and this. Chairperson, this and this. Mm. Chair, and when you are there, you feel you have it all done and finished. Be careful. Three, when you are pursuing a dream that makes you look out of the normal, out of your senses, you need to have a real life reference point that keeps you going in that kind of a lonely journey. Mm. When Santa was starting this game, she looked completely abnormal, but she kept on saying, but as you later see, all the big economies have written on value addition backed by design and fashion. fashion yep. <coughs> you don't just add value to leather mm. without having to design the leather to bring the kind of shoe that Alex is wearing. Yep. Yep. You don't just design a cloth mm. and don't have a great tailor to design and cut it the way it will fit on a chichi's shoulders properly. Yeah. So she said, I will refer to those ones to believe in this lonely journey and keep moving. Mm. And I thought those were extremely good headline points. Now here are the specifics that I picked from Santa's story. Number one, Santa said, gratitude and positive outlook to life are good as you walk the journey of entrepreneurship. Santa had, a, had has experienced times when even those that should have said thank you, they withheld that word and just let her push on with a tough game. Because once in a while, you need somebody who says, well done, this is great. Mm. But each time she would make errors, everybody was talking. So Santa, what did she do? She made some interesting comment here about herself. She learned to call herself a magical girl. Mm. To hold that kind of inspiration, yeah. Gratitude and positive outlook. I'm a magical girl. Number two, a bruised family history, a history that is dark, is no reason to hang in the dark past. Santa had a city kid's parenting that was rudely disrupted by war. She ended up getting displaced and going to southern Sudan in a refugee camp. camp. Mm. But despite in that kind of a situation, the girl comes up and begins to pursue a lofty dream of professionalizing the fashion and design industry that nobody had ever done. Very difficult mm. to lose what was great already. And then you pick up from there, but then you jump again and just say, I'm now going to go and do something that nobody mm. has done before. Breaking the ice. Exactly. Mm. Three, even in a sector driven by talent like hers, the beginning shall always be rugged. At the takeoff point, Santa did some amazing things. 
she did a pageant at the street, <laughs> getting people to say, let's do the thing at the street before the cars jam the road. Yes. Those days, good enough, mm. the jamming was hardly there. Mm. So she could have a good moment after kids have been dropped. Mm. The whole two hours are all free. The roads were free. She used those ones because she couldn't afford great hotel facilities. That took a lot of courage, you know, working it did. on, uh, yes. It did. And her father had retired. The father couldn't give her a shilling. But one of the statements she made that was extremely ringing well was, she said, many of us think fashion is about power, about lights and paparazzi. Mm. She said, no, there are more dark days than bright ones mm. when you're in this kind of industry. Mm. So she said, this is a sector where people could have a certain perception. Do it the normal way, the way you can manage it. Number four, passion is great, but it's not sufficient to keep one in the game. Santa's drive was underpinned by a lot of targeted reading research and learning. She had great command of facts on a global fashion industry. She had the market shares of every player across the country, I mean mm. across the, the globe. The world. Mm. Now that is something that you call your reference point. As people are doubting you, you say, but what are the statistics saying? What are the statistics saying? Why is Italy where it is? Mm. Why is Germany the way it is? Where, where it is? How about Switzerland with their watches? She said, have a reference point mm. and took a lot of learning and uh, research. To make a mark and create a sustainable industry or entity, a vision bearer has to introduce systems that separate you from your business. Mm. And that's the time when <coughs> Santa came to Enterprise Uganda. She said, I have managed to make this kind of a thing and I've received national and world-class accolades. But I'm beginning to have other issues that I didn't expect and people are not seeing them with me. I'm going to Enterprise Uganda and get myself schooled in business management skills. She signed up for our very premium product called Empretech Program. Mm. Empretech Program gives you the 10 traits that an international business operator requires to win in the business arena. That's the thing she came in for. And after getting that, she also went in for all the other elements of running a business, human resource management, delegation, finance, and governance. Mm. Extremely important. Mm. We also learned from Santa that just like a gifted footballer, owners of premium brands require coaching. And Santa said she has people she knocks their doors at and says, please give me a hearing here. Mm. And I'm one of those she cited. But she has got other people that she says she relies upon. And such people are normally not many. Yep. When you have what you call coaches, extremely few. The second last point that we picked from Santa's story was that don't allow image issues to cloud your business decision taking. In January, China closed. Mm. China was a major supplier of some of Santa's materials. The lady looked at the situation and said, if this has happened, and this thing looks viral, this thing could easily move beyond China and mm. could take a bit of a while. For her side, what did she do? She went and told the owners of Bugolobi Mall, the village market, I am exiting from this point. That is humility. That is foresight. And she said, I'm exiting. I'm letting go mm. my branch from this place. So many of us have tried to hang on to some of the things we should have left because of image. Finally, she mentioned something about government support. She said, securing government sectoral support, even with existing policies like BUBU and presidential directives, is tough and exhausting. Mm. Not easy to listen to a private sector person. Mm. This was her own statement. Santa has carried the weight of the fashion industry despite so much frustration. But she has kept on saying this is the sector that lifted the so-called first world to where they are. And she wants to hang in there. So these are the kind of things that I want Ugandans to know that each time we're here on a Sunday, we bring real life stories of real Ugandans with ordinary names. Mm. 
the lady from Unina Interior, Chaze, was yeah. the name. The person from Yugachik, it was Sekalala. Mm. The person from... Uh, Brother Jeno. Yeah? Yeah, Jeno. 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 <laughs> Jeno Lenga yes. from Lango. Yes, yes. Real Ugandan stories coming here and giving you experience of people making it in the private sector. And I love this Sunday afternoons. Nobody should miss them. Thank you, Charles. I like yeah. the distillation. I mean, yeah. um, I don't want to add any word to that. And I'm yeah. sure, viewers, you've picked quite a lot from Santa's story. This is the point, Alex, I turn to you. And uh, I'm sure my viewers can't wait <laughs> to hear your story. Mm. Who is Alex Nyonzima? Alex Nyonzima is a graduate of telecom engineering from Macquarie University. And that is my profession. By occupation, um, uh, I'm running a laundry and dry cleaning company called Daniel Dry Cleaners. Okay. Doing an amazing job. Fantastic, Charles. You should join the family. I'm waiting for you. No, I can <laughs> see. I really <laughs> adore you. You have to stand <laughs> out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but um, that is as far as uh, what I do for my 9 to 5, my career. In the evenings, I'm pretty much mm. preoccupied by Rotary. Mm. I'm a Rotary president of the Rotary Club of Kampala North. Wow. An amazing nice team. And uh, I should say Rotary has opened very many doors for me and opportunities. And uh, I think being here is one of them, as we shall see. You're already giving back. Yeah, I'm giving back, and definitely. You're getting mm. I'm getting way more than I'm giving back. That's a good one. Is now he a, a Rotary president? Yeah, I'm a Rotary president. So you're seeing the president. So wow. I'm the only president in the house, so I can say <laughs> I'm representing wow. His Excellency. I'm <laughs> humbled. <laughs> now, um, Alex, not every day that we see uh, people with, uh, you know, when we're at university, there are certain professions that felt like there were more professions yeah. than others. <laughs> yes. Uh, like sure. doctors, like engineers, you know, people in that space. Um, what leads an engineer into um, a laundry business or business at all? Okay. Uh, the story uh, starts way back, very many years back, BC. Uh, I used to work with my parents, my dad. So I have a pretty enrich entrepreneurship background. I think I started around P6, working with my dad. And uh, going to campus, I should say, was to complete the journey, the academic journey. Mm. And God willingly, if I was able to work for long in any organization, given the opportunity, yeah. I would have taken the skills to be exposed to professional networks and to gain professional skills. Mm. But uh, I ended up in two business for very many reasons. And one of them is because I lost my first job. Oh. I was prematurely laid off, you know? Okay. So after I was laid off, I knew uh, I really didn't have job security elsewhere. That must know? have hurt, eh? Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. It was <laughs> depressing. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to reveal the company <laughs> for, um, for purposes of reputational damage. Yeah. yeah. Because it's a, it's, a f it's a popular name around the city, you okay. know? Okay. But uh, it really, really gave me uh, a, tough, a tough decision to make. I had to prematurely engage into entrepreneurship, mm. you know? So I, I started down well. I hear you. Yeah, and here we are, pushing on, and uh, I can say it's, it's been an amazing journey. Who knows what's coming next? Paint yeah. for us a picture, Daniel. I mean, to a viewer listening or watching us at this particular moment in time, what is your, you know, scale of operation? I mean, um, what are we talking about here? Okay. Um, thank you, Charles. Uh, we started with about, I can give you a vague picture of about 50 to 100 units per day. By units, I mean articles or clothes we receive or we handle per day. Mm. And that was at our first branch, you know, at inception. Mm. And uh, after some time, we, you know, we branched off and we moved to Granny Pure Hotel. And going to Granny Pure Hotel really scaled us up. And uh, I think we're handling volumes about 500 units per day, you know. Yeah. Wow. As regards... As regards capacity. I hear you. So you're Much starting from where to come to Grand Imperial? Yes. We started from a place called Premier Hotel on Amirimba Road. Okay. It was a humble beginning, and considering we're just starting out, we couldn't afford to be located in a fancy building, and, you know, we couldn't afford. Mm. We couldn't afford the rent and uh, the running costs of being situated in, uh, in a strategic location like we currently have. Mm. I'm glad to say we finally can afford, and we are existing, mm. and maybe we're pushing to even greater locations. But in the start, that is, how, that is a, as far as we're dealing with. We're small, starting out, trying to cut down on costs. So we could afford, I mean. Mm. And uh, going to Grand Imperial has helped us manu uh, m multiply most of our operations in terms of machinery, uh, you know, 
human resource and capacity to have by a factor of 10. And I should say it's been, it's been the greatest decision we've met. Great. Now, um, before I bring in Charles here, um, I'm just thinking, um, why go into laundry? Because you could have done anything. You could have planted <laughs> the trees, you could have grown <laughs> mangoes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Laundry. Interesting. We were in a garage. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> An engineer. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Laundry and dry cleaning. When you sit down and do your desk research, could even be field research about our industry, you will find that at the time when I started in 2017, it wasn't heavily penetrated. Mm. Fully fledged companies around that time were about 10 only, you know? And uh, statistics from where this industry has succeeded before, from countries like Canada and the US. Uh, statistics gave us that the Great Depression, the recent depression of 2007, had a few business survive that hit, and among them was laundry and dry cleaning. Mm. It was essential. People could uh, afford to do away with all the luxuries life could afford, all the luxuries they were paying for, and uh, why they could spend money else, but they have to dress. Charles, you have to look smart every Sunday here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to dress. And uh, I felt that this is something and I can actually bite into. But most importantly, around the time when I started, I was working in a family business. Mm -hmm. I was at a Premier Hotel. And we had started out, and I figured we needed a laundry service, you know, to clean the linen in the rooms. So in my understanding, if a small hotel like ours needed such a service, there are probably hundreds of hotels out there that need the same service mm. and uh, have no means of doing it. Some are doing it the manual way yeah. in Benson's and getting old and worn <laughs> out by the yeah. day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, it's so yes. we thought that, you know what, let's get people out of Benson, mm. especially if we're having small hotels, you know. Change the game. Yeah, three stars here yeah, and two star hotels. Let's mm. just give them a cheap service. Mm -hmm. Not cheap, really, but affordable. affordable. Mm. Let's give them an affordable laundry service, commercial laundry service. Mm. And uh, we'll be the first to do it. Mm. I mean, as everyone else is targeting the high end um, hotels like the one in which we are incubated right now, we thought to ourselves, you know what, there is a young man down there, the small guy, mm. guy needs a laundry service. So putting all these factors into consideration, I decided to bite into laundry and dry cleaning. I hear you. Very interesting indeed. Again, um, I'm really burning to bring in Charles here, <laughs> but um, mm. I know my viewers want to know how big is Dunwell today before Charles comes in? Mm. Mm. Thank you. Interesting. As of 23rd, uh, August 2020, Dunwell sits at three locations. Grand Imperial Hotel, one day again, Old Kampala. That is as of today. I'm not sure what the statistics will be tomorrow. <laughs> 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 yes, tomorrow we'll is 24th. Daniel could be something else entirely. Mm -hmm. And I must say that uh, we're proud mm. of what we have so far. And uh, in the coming year, we're scaling up our locations. We're extending convenience to the last mile. Mm. We're, m we're partnering with a major retail partner who I can't really reveal on screen. You know, I don't want to preempt both my competitors and <laughs> 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 yeah, true. Fair enough. my customers <laughs> as well. But um, <laughs> we're partnering with a key retail partner to extend convenience to the last mile. Okay. And that will see us, you know, expand our footprint to very many locations. We'll bring convenience to the ordinary ma man and we'll break the misconception of the dry cleaning industry being a service for the fancy man, mm. for the upper class. So we are three branches. And my workmen and I are about 20, you know, fully mechanized, doing a professional service. I like the modesty with which you stating that, my workmates. Yeah, the <laughs> my workmates. <laughs> Not my workers. <laughs> no, 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 no. Charles, <laughs> this is the point when I bring you in. <laughs> Interesting. You know, I want viewers to really know that uh, when we bring people like Alex here, we want them to relate with the story. Mm. And what is just coming out of this story is an interesting uh, very, very interesting message. Here is Alex, a young man who gets a job, and within a very short time, the job ends. Mm. At that point, parents should have been again called upon and say, look for my job. Mm. Yep. I'm your son. I'm young. Alex, how old are you now? I'm 27. 27. <laughs> At 27, yes. and he has worked now many, how many years have you been running the business now? Three years. Three years. So he lost a job at 24. This is pretty much 
pretty, pretty much uh, mommy's son yeah. or daddy's son yeah. in, with a, a, a bedroom back at home. Mm. So when you lose a job at that age, <laughs> they simply say it's okay. <laughs> Come back home, look for another job. Yes. And you pass over the ball to the parents. Mm. Mm. He mm. said, no, we have a business where in our small guest house, I'm seeing something interesting here. Yeah. People want laundry services. Can this thing be made bigger? Mm. Can't we make this thing something more professional? He goes in there and with humility looks for affordable location. Yeah. Very, very important to note. Mm. She did this, he did not simply say, Mommy, please, I don't want to be embarrassed. I'm a graduate. I do a degree for people to see me in a funny place. Please make sure something's glamorous. Mm. He said, I'm going to start from some basic location. And when I'm there, I'm going to fight it up from that point. Yeah. Now, as he does whatever he's doing, the fellow begins to shine. Mm. And just to confirm that actually society is beginning to notice him, you don't become a president of a Rotaract club just because you're an Alex in your Zima. Yeah. People yeah. will be saying, why should he qualify? He's a president of a Rotaract club. Mm. The business he has picked up goes to a very premium location where few Ugandans, those who have got um, shops in Grand Imperial know, yeah. a, a small space there goes with not less than a thousand, one thousand, five hundred, two thousand dollars per month. Yeah. And I don't know how big the space he has taken there, but that is what it means to now grow from somewhere else, build the skills and begin to say, how do I now maximize my experience, my journey? And to me, that is extremely, extremely exciting. But he also did something else. He said, that's it. I go into this thing that has been inspired by the family business. Statistics elsewhere are speaking something. Mm. 2007 we had a, a depression when the entire world economically again went on its knees. Mm. And one of the businesses that was resilient was laundry mm. services. He did his homework. So he said, I've done my homework. I'm going into the thing, mm. but I'll give it a very, very practical entry point. Extremely important. Good, 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 good. Alex, mm. um, paint for us a picture. Um, how was the start? What kind of challenges did you meet and how did you really overcome to build what you have today? Challenges, challenges. Uh, allow me to say the challenge. My challenges aren't really um, unique to me. Mm -hmm. Probably all most starting entrepreneurs out there who aren't receiving handouts, who haven't had a soft bed, are facing entirely the same. Mm -hmm. So we started out, and uh, my goodness, working capital. The guy working capital was my nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Operating a dry cleaners was very challenging without working capital. And our sort of industry has a lot to do with gaining trust. Just for you to give me a suit of five million, mm. for you to trust me to clean your suit of five million, and I'm a startup operating for a month, mm. it would be a hard pill for you to swallow, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. You understand? Mm. So I had to do a lot of convincing. I had to sell my personal brand. Mm. I had to convince souls. I had to convert souls to believe into whatever I was trying to preach to them. So that was also very challenging because selling our service is really, really, really tasking. And it deals a lot with word of mouth and referrals. Mm. So Charles, if I do your work well, you'll probably tell Charles or Chichi that, you know what? Um, so, you know, I buy my suits from Plus X and they're really nice and I treasure what I wear. Yeah. You know, because if you use the dry cleaners, probably you treasure your clothes. Mm. You love your clothes. That's right. <laughs> so you'll approach Charles and be like, that guy is into something great. I think you should try, um, try him out. So winning customers like yourselves was very hard in the start. Mm. People confiding in you was very hard, aside the working capital. And the fact that where we were located, as much as it was a humble location, and we're parting with very, very little in terms of rent, that is ultimately where we're not supposed to be. Mm. We were targeting the wrong market. We had to move and situate ourselves in places whereby the passers-by, the people driving by the street, and the people walking around relate to what sort of service you are providing them. So downtown, you're downtown on Namirembe Road, and 
you know, someone mm. someone really can't feel mm. with what you're doing. <laughs> yes. yeah. Someone can't feel it. Seven yeah. million so It's down. an oh, industry no. of the <laughs> fancy, <laughs> fancy people, you know. Yeah. And uh, lazy people, they actually call them lazy people, yeah. you know. Yeah. So those, those were some of the challenges in this start. That's a very interesting one. Charles, last week when we were mm. discussing this, we got mm. uh, a message yeah. of uh, some of our viewers. They were in Mbuya and they were discussing. Um, mm. I think Santa mentioned mm. the issue of capital. Yes. And Alex here is mentioning it the as yes. being key. Yes. And then there was a debate. Our yeah. viewers were debating on the sides. They were like, yeah. please help us yeah. sort this <laughs> thing. Correct, correct, correct. Capital correct. And, uh, and brains. Yes. That's how they termed it. D that's right, yeah. What is more important? That's true. Uh, but again, as you respond to what Alex has, you know, or yeah. distill what Alex has put on yes. the table, yeah. um, you can help us address that issue as well. Because capital, especially yeah. for young yeah. Yeah. men and women yeah. um, who are beginning business, is really coming yeah. out as a very, very critical yeah. uh, element here. Yeah. Hmm. Yo, you know, to do a uh, business, the first thing you need to recognize is that there's no vacuum anywhere. As you go into a laundry business, somebody is already offering it. Yeah. Sure. He cited and said, if you have got your two million, three million, five million suit, you've been taking it somewhere. Yeah. Now, for me to pick you, there must be something you must invest in yeah. to convince me to come to you so that you begin to look like the kind of person who will give me my expectations. The first thing a customer will come in, he comes with minimum expectations. Right. Those minimum expectations, he knows there are a couple of options where he can get them sorted out from. Mm -hmm. That's where capital comes in. Now, for a beginner, many times resources, financial resources are extremely limited. And all you need to do is to invest deeply in yourself to come out and say, let me start where I will start from. But as you do that, mm. every next customer you handle mm. should be able to say, that was a brilliant job. Yeah. James, my neighbor, please go to Dunwell. Then the referrals begin to come in, as Alex is saying. Mm. So as you be start with the limited lean resources, work on that element of getting client loyalty, yeah. client referrals, mm -hmm. and begin to be build the volumes from there. So it will always be constant. The beginning will always be lean, rugged, basic. But no great brand started big. Good. So that's the good. Uh, and I like the news. fact that it's yeah. building a brand. Correct, yeah. You, you yeah. know there's a difference. Yeah. In Uganda, we yeah, tend to definitely. trade commodities, yeah. Yeah. goods and services, yeah. very and true. not brands. Instead I think that is a very, very good uh, very true. Uh, approach to that. Yeah. Viewers, you can be part of the discussion, um, mm. as usual. Um, we have our WhatsApp line. Um, you can start directing those comments and questions. Uh, we can unpack them as we move along. Now, at this moment, um, I'm going to take a very short commercial break. When we return, we'll get to hear um, actually how Alex's parents took it when he made the decision. I will call it a leap. Leap of faith. Into business <laughs> <laughs> after this break. <laughs> back it's once again the enterprise uganda business forums and um, today in the studio we have a very very powerful story um from an entrepreneur a young man uh in his 20s uh who is uh, really making it uh big in the uh, dry cleaning business and uh with me in the studio of course is uh, charles ochichi the business coach we're trying to distill uh lessons key learnings from uh this young man's uh, story. Uh, please, Alex, allow me to call you young man. Uh, <laughs> I, I need to beg because, uh, um, you know, sometimes <laughs> success has yeah. nothing to do with age. No. Yeah. yeah? Anyone mm -hmm. can make it. Now, Alex, um, you, before we went for the break, we're talking about the fact that, I mean, you go to school, your parents have invested in you. Mm. Uh, you do this really good course in engineering. Yes. And I'm sure you passed well. Amazing grades. Good. And, uh, you know, how do they take it? You go to them and you tell them, I'm going to join the dry cleaning business. And I would like to use the Luganda word, as we were mentioning in the break, <laughs> Dobby. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, 
imagining? How <coughs> did they take it? Uh, I thank my parents, first of all, for being really supportive. Mm. And until now, supportive from way back when they let me. They opened their doors for me to work with them. So my parents paid for me, uh, I think, till high school. I was, I, I was using government sp 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 sponsorship at the university. Mm. But starting at the university and leaving and then not practicing my profession, my parents may not really have been, we've never had that talk, yeah. I must say. But in my understanding, they weren't really uh, resistant of it because they have seen me work with them in, in entrepreneurship. My own father has two degrees. Mr. Mgisha is a humble man called Mr. Mgisha. Mm. He has two degrees and he has never practiced on a single day. Okay. You get. So I think. He's a businessman. He's a businessman. All right. Man in Chikubo, mm. selling clothes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think to him it was any other business. It runs, you know? in, a, it yeah, runs I, in the family. It runs in the family. If done it, you may not practice if you want. Mm. But if you want to practice, it is also okay. So I start my business and it's he's you. okay with it. I hear yeah. you. Now, um, at what stage do you, you know, um, say that, you know what, I think I've done business to a certain point, but I need some mentorship, <coughs> some coaching. Yes. Yes. During the times when we were moving from our previous location, mm. and I'm remembered to expand and situate ourselves strategically at Grand Imperial Hotel, we felt that we needed to work with the right people. Mm. We needed people to point us in the right directions. We needed people to help us call the right shots. Because as much as I had been working in a shop downtown for long, there's only so much you can get from professional business conduct there. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of uh, skill. There's a lot of skill set that you can mold when you're working in Chikubo. Mm. But you miss out on running a profession, running a streamlined, and running a formal business. Mm. So it was at that time that you know I thought of. I thought to it that I need someone to push me to grow my brand to a very, very big level, probably the levels of Cafe Javas, who knows, you mm. know? Mm. I may probably be wishful thinking, but if we can get there, why not? Yeah. So I meet a gentleman called Tony Otoa, Stan Big Uganda. Mm. He was the head of enterprise development. I know Tony, he was my colleague. Mm. <laughs> he was a journalist, <laughs> I have to mention that. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yes. till he jumped ship. So uh, Tony uh, onboards me onto Stan Big's enterprise development mm. program. Mm. And Stan Big, incubates me for a given period of time and feels like, you know what, right now where you are, you need a coach. You need someone to push you in terms of uh, human resources, financial management, you know, procurement, bidding and tendering, uh, quality and assurance management. And that is when they introduced me to Enterprise Uganda. Mm. And I met the amazing and awesome Charles Wachichi. So, my relationship with Enterprise Uganda has been amazing. Mm -hmm. And where the company is heading, I really, really believe they're going to play a key role and they're going to push me and mold me into the right person, the right leader mm -hmm. I need to be to handle the kind of volumes, the kind of resources, and probably the kind of spotlight we're going to be dealing with as Daniel Requins. Interesting. Charles. I think this really rhymes to our yeah, point yeah. that um, yeah. entrepreneurs need unholding. They don't true. just they don't just happen yeah. to move one from, from one point to another. Yeah. Yes. But what do we <coughs> pick there? Really? Really there are about two things that are so key here and whoever is listening should take this very seriously. Mm. We've said that we've had businesses starting and remaining micro for years. Yeah. Decades. Mm. Decades. Mm. It's terrible to have a micro enterprise for three years, for five years, yeah. for 10 years. You begin to say, I'm, I'm able to pay rent. Yeah. I'm able to dress myself, I'm able to eat. Now, if you have to begin to scale like the way they were doing, you need to now begin to say, what are my limitations? How do I separate myself from this business and this business begins to grow? And that's where I come to the second point. The first point was that he admitted that he needed to grow 
but he was short in some things. Yeah. He had the, 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 the laundry skills, but now he needed the business skills. Mm. And then that admission brings my second point, which is the pragmatic advice from Stanbic Bank. Stanbic Bank would simply say, you know, we're now shifting you from ordinary client to now executive suite. And after you have been taken to executive suite, now we've recognized you. You remain now there. We love you. Mm. Said no. Tony said you want to continue to grow. And now is the time for mentorship, for training. Now, I wanted to bring that up because bankers should recognize that the customer they have today who is able to borrow 10 million should be able to borrow next year 50. The other year should be able to borrow 200 million, mm -hmm. but borrowing with ability to bring it back without stress, because you built their strength, yeah. you built their absorptive capacity, you created their market dominance. And the bottom line is building. Building. Mm -hmm. It's not announcing and recategorizing and saying now, we b you used to be in this line whenever you come to the bank. <laughs> now we're putting you into this other line. Yes. Because of that, you now must succeed. Stand Big Bank said, no, yeah. we need to grow you. And to me, that was fundamental, and bankers need to pick a leaf from that. Good. Alex, mm. you're 27 years. Yep. And, uh, you know, at that age, um, if you have money, and, 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 and really, you've covered some good ground in that space. I mean, here you are, you have a business, it has three branches. I'm sure you're employing quite a number of people as well. And... Uh, it's a challenge for many young women and men to actually stay, uh, for lack of a better word, humble <laughs> and focused. <laughs> Humility. <laughs> How are you able to manage, you know, um, uh, of course you're still aspiring to achieve many things, but yeah. let me borrow the word success. Mm. Um, and... I don't know how to state this, but mm. let me again say it, mm. age mm. and stay... Focus. You know, focus on the vision that you want to achieve. My background contributed immensely towards the molding of the right character in me. So working with my parents, especially working with my dad, taught me something. So in Chikubu, there, in order for you to make it, um, in order for my parents maybe to make it to where I got, they've gotten, you ought to have goal-directed, self-imposed delay of gratification. Mm. It is very, very important. And uh, probably that's why that there's a misconception of what really got goes, goes on down there. Down there. Mm. Yeah, these guys are doing good for themselves. But, you know, we don't really understand. We have a superficial understanding of how business runs mm. because they practice at most humility. Yeah. And uh, if I feel like I'm derailing, yeah. once in a while, I go back to the big man. For realignment. And we have a realignment. reconfiguration. We have a chat. You know, he gets me back on track mm, and he one. reminds me of what we've been doing over and over again. And <coughs> uh, in order for us to stay focused mm. and humble. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Now, I'm going to ask you this as, um, you know, a matter of, um, um, it's a bit related to policy. Because we know that government has come up with a number of programs to reach out to young people, the youth. Yes. And I want to pick your mind on um, how you look at those programs and what you think uh, should actually, should these programs look like to deliver the intended uh, objectives or goal? Government programs are really, really interesting. They're fascinating. Uh, because they're doing an outside-in approach, I should say, instead of inside-out. Mm. So if the government wakes up one morning and identifies a group you know, of youth, Usually they are grouped into circles or <coughs> associations. So they identify a group of youths who feel like they need funding and uh, extend this funding to them. Yeah. Government many a times is doing it on the basis that capital is going to drive them to achieve the ultimate success they are earning for as youths. Yeah. Instead of having in mind that the fact that capital does not build an entrepreneur, by the way. Yeah. It doesn't it, you know? These youths many a times need to build a business acumen 
and get the right business mindset in order for them to make sense of this money that is being availed to them. Otherwise, they will squander it. Mm. You know, the, there's also a challenge of entitlement. So the government, the president meets you and they give you a hatchery. The g president gives you a hatchery and tells the president, you know what, we don't have chicks <laughs> for <laughs> the hatchery. We don't have eggs for the hatchery. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The president is like, okay, let me give you chicken. They give you chicken, and like, you know what? The chicken need to drink water. <laughs> the president extends, <laughs> you know, and uh, the president tells you, you know what? Okay, here's a water source, and you're like, you know what, president? <laughs> I am a graduate. I can't fetch water from point X to point Y <laughs> carrying jerry cans. Come on, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole program starts to crumble because the people who are given the resources. I think this happened in Eastern Uganda and Jinja. Yeah. The people who are given the resources. They did not have the business acumen. Give that money to me, my friend. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I think that's an interesting <laughs> chance. I hear you. I, I, I can imagine what you can do with that. But um, I think it's preparation, preparation. Really? Preparation. Really? I think it makes a very fundamental statement that we all need to know. Because not only government that's trying to push young people into yeah. business through something like a handout. Mm -hmm. We have done it as families. We have done it as relatives. We have done it as friends as churches, as development entities. And we thought that if I gave you capital, I've created an entrepreneur. Mm. As he's saying, that capital does not create an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone who delivers a solution people want to buy. Mm. Not just saying that now I'm a young person, you turn up and buy from me. You've been given capital. Capital needs to be translated into a solution mm. and is that translation of capital into a solution where the business mindset and acumen come in. Yeah. It is an easier shortcut of just issuing something. But then again, it touches something interesting, which is says entitlement. Yes. I am your, un I'm your, you are my uncle. Mm -hmm. I'm entitled to receive money from you. Mm -hmm. Please don't come and ask me where I, how I use the money. You are the local leader in this place. I'm supposed to get money from you. Mm -hmm. Please do not disturb me. It actually happens a lot when you yeah. have... Uh, um, a seemingly prosperous relative in the family. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and everyone is like, you see yeah. here? <laughs> <laughs> we are here suffering. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that entitlement thing there is a keyword, not just for government. Yeah. All of us who are trying to push young people into business, tell them we are pushing you into this thing. This is a sector that doesn't know your age. Mm. Go there and fight it out. And I'm sure he will tell you the kind of competition he's facing and challenges mm. are deep. That's interesting. Mm. Alex, are you mentoring any young people? Are you, you know, um, giving back? Because, I mean, um, from what you're telling me, I can see, like I said earlier, that you've covered some good ground. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm giving back in two different ways. Number one, I'm giving back under Rotary. It's very important. I, I'm active in community service. I think my badge as a president can really tell you that I give back. And number two, giving back to my industry, skilling, mm. training. I think that's my personal and humble contribution towards the local content campaign. Mm. So I am trying as much as possible to provide what I never received in the start. Because when I was starting out, when I was opening up Danwell, there was no one willing to train me because I was a potential competitor in case things worked out. Oh. So I had to gather myself up, swallow the bitter pill, and know what? That I'm going to have to receive training elsewhere mm. if I have to do this thing right. Mm. So we receive our machinery. January 2017, we're fully equipped. Mm. We had our machinery, actually. We never started until September. So there's that whole gap. Now, during that time, I had to move out of the country and go to an interesting place called Kenya Utali College to gain sector-related technical skills so that I can do things right. So after we got this, we plugged into the industry. Mm. And that is what I'm doing. I'm training people in the skills that I got, the skills I couldn't have gotten. If you want to train in my industry, I run an open-door policy. Mm. You come around and we train you in what we failed to get at the right time. But also helping people in industries not related with mine. I can just give you, you know, a page of my rule book. And I tell you, you know what? Up until now, this is what we've done mm. to get us wha where we are. And uh, if you want to achieve in more than what we have, a you B can try. Yeah, a B C D. Yeah, <laughs> try, try. I've introduced some to Charles Ochichi and some to the business incubator. Talk about that and the need giving back. I have Joel here from Okono saying 
please, I want to start a dry cleaning business. Advise me on how to handle it and customer reality. That's Joel. The first thing Joel needs to do, if he has the machinery like I did, yeah. <laughs> just remain closed, I should say. Mm. Because the <laughs> moment, <laughs> <laughs> the moment you open shop mm. and you start fumbling and gambling, Joel, I hope you're listening in. Yeah. You start gambling and fumbling, you are going to lose very many years yeah. of what you hope to achieve. Yeah. Get trained, get sector-related technical skills, get professional business skills from organizations like Enterprise Uganda. Mm. Mm. And make sure you're running things the right. Before you even look at capital, the knowledge is very, very key. Yeah. You should ultimately know how you're going to run a professional company, a company that is going to scale up and move its footprint into the Ugandan game. Charles, I have someone here from Chisoro. Yeah. Nathan. Oh, that's where I come from. Mm. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so you have, uh, <laughs> yes. So he's wondering, mm. he's saying, um, because we talked about the issue of capital. Yeah. And he's saying, um, can you just give him a simple digest of how we can mobilize capital as, you know, a person who wants to do business? What can they look at? It's called Joel. Nathan. Nathan. Nathan, yes. Sir, yes. Na na Nathan I want to tell him this, that please, capital is any resource you can package. Your own energy, your own networks, your own idol assets that you can convert into a solution. So start with what is within your reach and convert it into a solution. That is capital. Let's not glamorize the word capital to look at a certain basin full of money with a minimum size of money before you can take off. That's why if you look at almost all the stories of beginners, mm. the word capital has never been adequate. Mm. Never. Mm. But somewhere along the way they started. In other words, if you can get to a point where you sell the first solution and the first customer gives you money and there's a profit in it, you've started the game. That capital is sufficient to get you moving. Right. So you could have started with one chicken. Mm -hmm. You could have started with five eggs. But move the five eggs to another place where that, those five eggs will give you a profit so that the next buying of eggs, you're not buying five, you're buying seven. Right. Sell again the seven, but then the next time when you're selling the next eggs, you're not selling seven, you're selling 15. You've taken off. Right. Do not glamorize the word capital and make it look some very, very <laughs> utopian <laughs> word. Away from us. Correct. Well, I have Ezra here, while you're at it, um, yeah. from Bali. You know, Alex here talked about <coughs> brand royalty. Yeah. Actually, brand. Yeah. And also building trust from people. He says he's the founder of resource enterprise, um, found of three resource enterprises. Mm. I want to hear from Charles. How can one build brand royalty? Brand loyalty is built with the client satisfaction. Mm. So the first thing is, what are you going to sell for which you are confident your customer will be satisfied? Yeah. It could be food. You may not be at the scale of Serena, but you could be at the scale of somebody who supplies food to a building site. Mm. Let the building site fellow say, this food is very good food, and they refer you to the next building site then the next one, then the next one. Within six months, you'll be supplying various sites as a brand that knows how to supply food mm. to the building sites. Then you start a restaurant. Then from the restaurant, you keep on building. That's how the story of Cafe Javas was started. Yeah. They started with one outlet mm. in a fuel station mm -hmm. and said, let's make the first customers in this first outlet to be happy. Mm. Mm. Then as they begin to talk about the place, the place gets what? congested yeah. you open the next branch mm -hmm. then another branch then the brand begins to build its own identity and life yeah. Danwell is doing exactly that mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. they move to wherever they are moving nobody wants to see fluctuation in standards if it's done well it is done well yeah. that is it mm -hmm. if it's coca-cola it's coca-cola mm -hmm. if it's cafe javas no matter wherever they are located it's cafe javas Start with ensuring that brands are not just put on television in a newspaper or just announce that we are the best. Let the customers begin to see you as a deliverer of a consistent, admired, respected solution. Great. Um, 
Alex, we had a major disruptor this year, which is COVID-19. Of course, we can't end any discussion without talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we're doing whatever we're doing, and then this happens. How did it treat you, and um, how did you manage to uh, keep in business? Because, I mean, the lockdown happened when? March? March. Mm. We were in August. Yeah. Even before that, mm. you know, there were business was already here and there, mm. you know, with issues out of the country. How did it impact you, and how have you managed to stay afloat? Thank you. Thank you, Charles. So COVID came around and uh, mandatory lockdown was uh, implemented. And uh, people were forced to work from home, mm. were advised to work from home if they really wanted to work. Mm. And the airports were closed. So hotels, maybe like this one we're in, faced a huge drop in terms of clientele. Yeah. So we lost a couple of hotels that we're doing contractual business with. And uh, the fact that people were working from home meant that all they were doing as a dress code was pyjamas and crocs. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so that <laughs> affected our volumes. But amazingly, being in this and having nowhere else to look meant that we have to make it work, mm. you know? Mm. We have to feed from here and there's nowhere else we're going. So we had to re-strategize. We had to go back to the drawing board and look into a new business model completely, venture into new markets to try to get our volumes up. And we are trying. Mm. We are trying to get back to where we, at least we are 70% of where we are before COVID. And maybe in the next month, if we keep doing the right things mm. and we we implement all that is uh, in our new business plan, probably we'll be back at full capacity. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Yes. Now, um, I'm going to ask you this as, um, you know, um, a young man who's doing business and, I mean, you've reached where you've reached before Charles comes in. Mm -hmm. um, many business people, especially people your age, when they seem to make it in business, you know, they find themselves swimming against certain tides. Sometimes it's envy, yeah. sometimes it's uh, people who can't wrap their minds around the fact that <laughs> you can break certain <laughs> walls at that yeah, age. Yeah. How have you been able to circumvent this and stay and be where you are? Stay the course. <coughs> wow. It's, it's, uh, like you said, it's actually challenging for you know, someone to find a young man behind uh, a great brand like Daniel is right now. You know, they can't storm up. They can't fathom the fact that you're the person giving them headache. Mm. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we practice healthy competition. Mm. It's very important. And uh, we try to tell you, you know what, don't be overcharged elsewhere because uh, you don't know what we are offering. If you're offering the same service, we are giving you better value. And uh, you can come to us. And also, I try to make them play catch up where I can. Mm. You understand? You, you become the pest setter. I try to be a pest setter. And I know some of them are watching. But I try to be a pest setter mm. in what I can. And lastly, I established my own niche. Mm. You have your clientele. You've been established. You've been in the game for 20 years. It is okay. It is okay. You know what? Do your thing. I established my own niche entirely. And I do a lot of awareness because, like I shared, there are very many misconceptions about our industry. People think our service is for the upper class only. So we try as much as possible to break that misconception with our niche. And uh, the next products we are onboarding into the market are going to be tailored towards Dunwell's niche, not trying to compete with whoever we found in the game. Mm -hmm. Charles. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think um, Alex is uh, one person Ugandan should be very proud to have mm -hmm. in the market. Mm -hmm. For a young person to be knowing that competition does exist, but then you begin saying, why should all the brands, all the players be trying to chalk off a young person entering the sector? And he begins to have a still mind and says, you know what? I'm not going to divert my mind mm. and lose my ability to be innovative and be able to come up with solutions that serve my customers better. Mm. In the process, the jealousy envious person is losing grounds yeah. 
because every day you are saying, look at him, he's again receiving many clothes from all these places. Look at him, in the process, you are disrupting the brain that's supposed to be doing exactly what he's doing, yeah. and you are concentrating on losing and paining yourself over some old success. Yeah. He is saying, how do I make sure that as people are looking at me, let that be an inspiration for me to know that I'm doing something right. Yeah. Keep at the game, get better mm. and better and better. Stay ahead. Don't waste your energy on the competition that is failing to focus on how to serve a customer better. Mm. Just keep moving and moving. And then he says, keep close to your customer. Keep close to your customer. This is a sector of trust. And he's saying, I will build that word every day with my existing customers. It is the kind of a thing that will take him miles and miles ahead. And then he's also saying, I'm not, I'm not shy about building people in the sector. Mm -hmm. Let me keep building whoever comes into my place. I give you the skills. If you remain very good, if you find that you have been given whatever opportunity to move on, he says, I will keep on building people for the sector. After getting classic skills from Utali. That's a good one indeed. You know? That's quite, quite, quite um, a good mm. one. Because you rarely see, if it is competition, people just want to, yeah. um, they, they, they play with their cards very close to their chest. Very true. Yeah. Mm, they don't want to yeah. share. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but um, Alex, um, there's a question I want to put before you, which we've tackled here, Charles, before. Yeah. The issue of relatives always comes into the yes. picture. Yeah. yeah. Relatives being employed in business. Yeah. Are you employing any, Alex? And uh, if you are, how is this working out for you? The closest relative I'm currently employing is a nephew of mine, actually. Okay. And I'm employing him... Uh, Older, younger? Younger. Oh, that was strategic. <laughs> 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 and I'm employing him on the grounds that he prov he brings value. Mm. He brings value to the Not point. because he's your nephew. Not because we are blood related. He mm. brings value to the table. And when he's in in-house, he's subjective to the same rules and ethical code of conduct as the rest. Mm. He's accountable. He's equally accountable as our other workmates. Okay. And that is the closest to family I'm working with right now. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Um, Charles, I have yeah. someone here from um, Somalia, Stephen. He's actually one of our ardent watchers. Yes. And he's saying, what input are you giving the youth in the village? If yes, how can they contact you to improve? That is to Alex. But then to Charles, he's saying, can we have learning centers across the country to enable every Ugandan get some of these entrepreneurial skills? I think we've tackled that, but for purposes yeah. again of our uh, new viewers who keep coming in, probably you can touch that a little. Alex? The youths in the villages. Mm -hmm. Wow. If I don't get it right, I apologize because I've not lived in a village, so it's not relatable for me. Okay. Mm. It isn't relatable for me. Mm. Mm. But for the youths in the village, one thing you won't go wrong with if you bring value onto the table mm. in whatever sector you're in in whatever industry you're in the value you bring onto the table irrespective of your degree of literacy mm. of ec or exposure what value are you bringing to the table from agriculture to production to tourism to manufacturing to uh, to hotelier hospitality the extra value you're bringing onto the table matters a lot matters a lot and it will help guide you it will help push you to greater heights mm -hmm. if you keep wanting to add extra value onto the value you added yesterday in mm -hmm. simple terms you're not being complacent about your current situation you're being discomfortable about being comfortable you're going to go somewhere mm -hmm. thank mm -hmm. you charles He's, uh, he's touching the right patterns even in terms of advice he has offered to the people located in the village. Because the reality is this, where you are located is not genetic. You can start from the village, mm. start delivering values, and start dominating a county. Before you know it, you are dominating a district. Mm. And then you take on three districts, and then you move to a regional city. Mm. From a regional city, you are headed for Kampala. 
So let nobody ever imagine that if you are located in the village, that's your abode yeah. for life. Yeah. What value are you giving in that location? And is it growing? Mm. If it's growing, you have started a journey that is going to be mesmerizing and you don't know how soon you could be a big store across the region. Mm. Very, very important. Then there's something that about, uh, that the Somali person commented about um, centers across the country. I want to say that uh, Enterprise Uganda right now with the Minister of Finance and other development partners are thinking of creating centers that bring the stories we keep sharing here every Sunday closer to every Ugandan. The appeal has been every day repeated and we're hearing you. Mm. And we are going to do exactly that. In the next three, four years, you are going to have a very, very powerful institution where you are and delivering the kind of impact that we're seeing every Sunday here. Mm. So what we're doing now is to bring from the 120,000 Ugandans who have worked with and show you what has happened to Ugandans that have worked with us. Some of them 20 years, some of them three years, some of them just four years, but those are the kind of things we are going to replicate and deepen across the country. Great. Through centers starting with Kampala mm -hmm. and then across the country. I think it's very important, Charles, because uh, I mean, I've met a number of people who are telling me, you know what, I think yeah. I wish we could get that kind of uh, yeah. uh, training and unholding. But, but Alex, um, coming back to you, um, what would you say today um, are some of your greatest achievements in life or your greatest achievement? It can only be one, I think. <laughs> my greatest achievement in life right now, honestly, is Donald Ray Aquinas. Mm. That is my greatest achievement. Because the engineering degree wouldn't have counted for something I've ever, I've ever been practiced, you know? Mm. I didn't practice. I'm not doing it professionally, so I can't count on it. So Daniel Dry Cleaners is my greatest achievement right now. My greatest humble achievement. achievement. Yeah, and I hope to even make it greater. I hear you. When you wake up every day, what is that vacuum? That I know you've talked about royalty and all yeah. this other thing that you know keeps you going and say i'm going to make this happen this is what is driving me and this is what i want to achieve what is that thing that you really really uh keeps you going we plugged into the industry and we burned down the bridges yeah so there is no turning back for us i started out the laundry and dry cleaning service and uh, i did away with practicing of engineering so I have nowhere to look elsewhere. So I either make it work or I make it work. Uh, well, lucky for me, I have less responsibilities, you know, and less things to keep me <laughs> distracted, mm. <laughs> you know. So that is why I can afford to stay focused and know that ultimately this is all I have to make work. And also what makes me really put in my all is uh, the number of years I've put into this company yes. and uh, comparing the equivalent years someone would put into the engineering career. An engineer is far yeah. ahead. Yeah. Honestly, what Daniel pays me right now isn't what is paid an engineer. An engineer is paid a lot of money, you mm. know? So my motivation is, you know what? I have to earn my value's worth, my knowledge's worth, you know? If I was supposed to be earning this right now as an engineer practicing professionally, can Daniel make me and the same. Mm. So that is my driving factor every day as I walk out of my home mm. and walk into Danwell. I hear you. It has to work. It has to work. It has to. There are no two ways about it. That's a good one. I mean, uh, talking about responsibilities, I'm sure there are some viewers who are watching and saying, <laughs> is, Daniel, <coughs> is Daniel threatening <laughs> there? Or? Uh, but you can think about it <laughs> as Charles comes in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Charles. Yes. You know, yeah, uh, he has said his greatest achievement, the degree is not number one. Yeah. It should have been number one. Like most families would say, I just say, you know what, first engineering degree in the family, first do doctor, uh, doctor in the family, mm. first lawyer in the family said, no, my first greatest achievement is creating done well. Yeah. And you can see where it's coming from. Mm. As human beings, we want to assess our fulfillment not just in terms of what we have achieved for ourselves but what you are doing to society mm. 
There is more excitement in receiving 500 units a day and ensuring all of them have been well pressed, delivered intact, and the customers are happy. Mm -hmm. And they are saying, thank you so much. I wanted my wedding garment ready within six hours. You made it in four hours. Mm -hmm. More exciting, yeah. more fulfilling, and it's a daily feedback. So getting people to appreciate that success is no longer more about yourself, but about what you are doing to other people's lives, to harness people's talents as employees, mm -hmm. is much more broader outlook to life than just saying, I got this degree, or I got this paper, or right. I got this rank. Right, right, yeah. right. Alex, um, I want to know how you're embracing IT, um, you know, in your business. Because, I mean, we live in a digital era. And, um, in, in fact, I've been intrigued by one of our viewers here, Robert, who is saying he's building a platform that can bring together all dry cleaners to meet <laughs> their customers. He has already seen an opportunity. Charles, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> yes. If you have viewers who can wow. see opportunity <laughs> yes. on set and go for it, I mean, mm. so is this something you're considering? I mean, are you already there? Because, I mean, today, and what COVID has actually brought to the fore is that people no longer have to meet physically to do business. Yeah. Wow, what's his name? Uh, Robert. Robert, uh, Robert, I look forward to meeting you and Joel as well. Uh, my door is open. Come on, let's discuss how we can make this happen. But on the side of Danwell, post-COVID, we had to embark on automation of most of our processes. Yeah. You know, we had to put down the manual ways of running operations and automate a load of things mm. we are doing to both add value into the customer and to give them a platform whereby they can access our services in the convenience of their offices or their homestead. Like I told you, extending convenience to the last mile. Mm -hmm. We are bringing convenience to the, your doorstep. We are knocking on your door. I hear you. If you're going to work from home, you're still going to be dressed. Mm. So mm. we'll bring that convenience to the last mile. And I think platforms like that, the gentleman is proposing to bring, to, you know, to aggregate all these dry cleaners into one, one umbrella, I think it will work. It will work if it's adding value and if it's bringing convenience to the mm. customers and it's automating mm. most of our purchasing process. And Charles always says that if you offer yeah. a solution, that yeah. meets Win. people's problems. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. You'll be in business. Yeah. Sustainable business. Very mm. true. Charles, as you come in, I have someone here. I think he's a teacher. Mm. And he's um, actually saying the program is good. He's, um, he's picked quite a number of lessons. But then he's saying teachers now need to look beyond boards. He's, she's saying she's now a cobra. Uh, you know, uh, doing shoes. <laughs> but <laughs> again, throwing a question to you. Yes. What advice can you have for not just teachers, I want to rephrase, yeah. but to people that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic mm. who probably may not be working at this particular moment in time. Mm. I think to anybody who has had um, a job lost because of COVID, my advice is that please try to ignore the original or earlier label you used to have. A teacher, uh, a doctor, a nurse, whatever title you had, and begin to see yourself as a human being that is ready to offer a solution to the public. Now that means whatever resources you currently have, mm -hmm. start with those ones. Yeah. It could be a room in the house where you are currently renting and you are even in areas. Instead of allowing each girl to be in her own room, let the girls all go and share one room. Secure one room and begin to start either a restaurant or a place where you can offer a solution from there. The resources you have right now, l redirect those resources and remove underutilization of resources in terms of time, in terms of space, in terms of whatever equipment that you have. Take advantage of them mm -hmm. and use them better. Mm -hmm. Now, that means you've got to now almost wear the, the mindset that Alex has demonstrated here. He went through a degree that people would have said that's an engineer we are proud to have in, an engineer and you can't remove it from him mm -hmm. but now Alex is also saying I will always be an engineer but right now I'm delivering solutions through laundry services mm -hmm. be flexible mm. have positive outlook to life 
and begin to discover the other talents that you have. That people have always told you and you have never quite experimented them. They are there and you need to begin to work on them and bring them out into, into the space. I yeah. hear you. Mm. Um, Alex, um, in your journey in business so far, if there's something you feel you'd have done better, you know, uh, what would it be? Wow. If there's something I would have done better in my business, I think it's starting with organizations like the Stanvik Business Incubator and Enterprise Uganda from the very start. Mm. To avoid a lot of those unforeseen pitfalls, poor decision making. They come at a cost. They come at a cost. They impact immensely on whatever you're trying to build. There are very many mistakes we make in the start. Mm. Very many young people my age, younger or older, are making blunders in whatever they are running. Mm. You know? People are people are not being loyal to their commitments. People are delivering substandard products. People, do, people are running informal for very many years. Someone is proud to tell you, you know what, I'm happy I've been in this business for five years. And they say, okay, okay, okay. Mm, mm. But are you registered? Unfortunately not. So a lot of those blunders we make in the start. And I must be frank with you, if on day one of operations, like I said, I got sector related, sector-based technical training from a state-of-the-art facility, institution in Nairobi. And yes, I had the production skills. I had the technical skills. But I lacked the business skills. Yeah. I wasn't <coughs> a leader, actually. I was very poor at decision-making. I had only worked for two months in a certain company where I was fired. That <laughs> means I, <laughs> ne <laughs> I never interfaced mm -hmm. with professional conduct, mm. with leadership skills, with how an organization is run. I was a young guy mm. leading people older than me, you know? So if in the very start I had identified the right key partners, the key players to help me plug in the right way, to plug onto the right frequency, mm. I should say, apologies for my engineering jargon, <laughs> I wouldn't have, <laughs> I think I would be further. You'll be further. I would be further, <laughs> honestly, mm. because to, go, to get the professional leadership skills, I had to join Rotary. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I had to join Rotary to help me. Now, the business skills, I had to look for people like Charles or mm. Enterprise Uganda. Now, if I had these people from the start, oh my goodness. To get the calibration to actually. Yes, yes. You know, it's quite interesting because, um, Charles, yes. I was, um, someone was actually telling me their experience. Mm. You know, they go and do a job somewhere. And uh, they, wa they, they weren't formal. Yeah. Uh, they do a good job. They were good mm. at what they were doing. Yeah. And picking from Alex here, he was already good at dry cleaning. Yeah. But he hadn't yet structured, done yeah. this formalization here and there and that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. These guys do an amazing job and they're like, guys, yeah. come and pick your paycheck. Very true. But bring Very A, B, C, D, and one. Yeah. And one yeah. of them was. Uh, Certificate of incorporation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had none. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, and yeah. they had to rush and register. So when yeah. they presented it, they were like, but you need the job <laughs> in February, you think <laughs> says <laughs> September. Yeah. <laughs> Quite interesting. <laughs> no, it is, it is, it's an interesting scenario. And again, I think we need to get more and more stories of formal enterprise durable success. Mm. The story of the dad is Mugesha. Yes. The story of the Mugishas is an interesting story. Mm. Um, there is a study which confirms that if you want to know that the spirit of enterprise and entrepreneurship has sat into your family, mm. into your DNA, let it move across three generations. Yeah. That the Mugisha man, I don't know how the father of Mugisha was, did it beautifully and he has given Alex, the son, the same spirit and the things flowing beautifully. Mm. So now this is the kind of um, culture and inheritance and behavior we need to infuse in ourselves Actually, yeah. for us to begin building businesses that create generational wealth. 
I think that's very important. Mm. Because it is so easy to be so happy as an individual yeah. to do your normal assignment and you are paid as a person and the story ends there. Now, there is only so much energy you can have even when you are as energetic and as young and vibrant as Alex. There is no way Alex can do 500 suits excellently in 24 hours. Mm. Mm. Now, if he cannot, he is going to mess up those things and he will unravel his own story. Mm. So that thing of informality and people saying, you know what, why should I formalize, why should I? It is short-termism mm. and it is not something you just announce. Mm. You need to get what he was talking about that when dad begins to tell him, you know what, we as a family were always goal-oriented. Yeah. We as a family were people of values. Please, Alex, can you continue to make our family brand, our family identity, a proud identity. Now, that goes beyond just you as a person delivering solutions and enjoying yeah. some check that works when the knees and the back is still strong. <laughs> I there think will come a time when those knees and the backs will not be able to hold you together. Absolutely. Mm. And the brain may be working, mm. but that working brain <laughs> needed a team of people you direct. Yes. Yes. Even when you're in your wheelchair, you could be doing that. Absolutely. But not the same wheelchair person mm. trying to deliver an architectural plan for a, a 60 floor building. Mm. It's just impossible. No, no, no. And you yeah. must have mentored some people <laughs> to do yeah. that work for you. I think that's mm. very important because uh, mm. and it goes to the parents. Yeah. Because right now, a number of parents are stuck. Yeah. It's the word they are using. Yeah. Although I would look at it as an opportunity mm. with kids home. Yeah. And I think it's time now to recalibrate and reconfigure them and yeah. you know help them see some of these opportunities very they true. are those that are mature enough at university correct for instance alex has, to, has shared with us that he he got this dream when he was still at university yes went for it and yes. it's now a business he's doing and employing others and his conversation is not a conversation of apology yeah. that you know i'm just trying to do this as i look for a job yeah what are you doing? I'm just doing this as I look for a job. <laughs> yes. He's simply saying, this is what I'm doing, yes. and in case you want my services, I'm yes. available. Yes. Yes. That is positive. Mm. Mm. That is somebody who says, can I make a difference in your life? Mm. Mm. And you want to do business with such a person who is warm. Mm. As opposed to somebody saying, you say I'm just here because I'm looking for a job, in case you know anywhere. Mm. Anywhere. Mm. I can do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very. I have Anne here mm. in Entebbe. She's saying she's quite inspired by the discussion. Yeah. She was uh, working formerly in a tour and travel agent. Yeah. You know what this thing did to tourism and the tour yeah. and travel business? Yeah. And she's telling us yeah. she's happy they're selling Skumawichi in Entebbe. Can oh, you imagine? Very inspirational. Very indeed. good. Very yeah. inspirational indeed. <coughs> Viewers, I must apologize. We weren't able to pick calls today. I know uh, many wanted to call in and have uh, be part of this discussion. But we've managed to pick some of these um, pointers and questions mm. and comments you were sending us through the WhatsApp line. Um, but as you've had, the discussion is about really how you can make it in business from <coughs> really practical experiences of people that have made it. Mm. Alex here is an inspiration to a number of young people out there. He's in his 20s, 27 years. Actually, when I listen to Alex's story, I'm like, I think I began late. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, True. I should have begun True. early. And, but, yeah. uh, well, uh, they say it's never too late. Yeah. Uh, you, it's never too late for you as well. You can make that decision and say, mm. especially if you're a young man at university, mm. we have this long holiday. We never mm. planned it, but anyway, mm. it's here with us. We don't know when mm. uh, institutions of higher learning are going to be opened. And I mm. think, Charles, it can mm. be an opportunity for someone to really, yeah. you know, get out that yeah. potential yeah. and um, turn it into something at and this particular moment. And, and I must say this, that also... Whatever you learn because of COVID is something you should be able to retain and combine with yep. any other thing or profession yeah. that you may be able to go back to post-COVID. And it's not an excuse. You, you call it an excuse enterprise? It is an sorry. excuse, yeah. <laughs> yes. We yeah. will mm -hmm. normally hate anything mm -hmm. that somebody has been able to do and you are still hanging on it as a basis for not doing something. I hear you. This word of capital. How many people that are known to have progressed anywhere in the country and there are many everywhere yeah. who were given that tomorrow you are starting a business here is envelope go and start a business mm -hmm. if you get to any sub county then a county then a district in uganda and you pick the top 10 business people out of 10 if you get more than two 
who when they were starting, somebody gave them an envelope and said, please, here's an envelope, can you go and start? Call a chichi urgently. <laughs> <laughs> because it is it's just not possible. It's not. Really. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't. And all of them have had what I call bridging business opportunities. Mm -hmm. Started with something small, then went to this one, then went this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. Today we are looking at almost a finished story. Mm -hmm. Perfect. By the time this man later will be moving on from dominating the laundry services and then entering hotel chain business and then entering into real estate and what have you, somebody will never associate him with an Amrembe small outlet. Absolutely. And there is say it is, it is, no, 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 it's not possible. They always spot them when they are big. Correct. Yeah. Alex, your last word. <laughs> to my friends, to my agements, to anyone listening in, to anyone watching, it's very important not to be complacent, like I kept sharing. Be uncomfortable about being comfortable. Mm. Make them play catch up if you can. If you're uncomfortable about being comfortable, you will do great things, you will add value, and you will make them play catch up. That is your competitors, if mm. you have. Mm. Be the trendsetter if you can. If you can't be the trendsetter, identify even that one small thing that will be significant about you, that will make you a trendsetter that will make you the king of your small niche, mm -hmm. however small. I hear you. Yes. Charles, yes. how do you wrap this? My message to the Ugandans is that um, if there is anything you can pick up from the Sunday afternoons, it is that there are different shades of opportunities through which people enter the private sector. Mm. Today we have a story of somebody who has used the family route. We had a case of a lady whose father had retired and had no money, but she had a talent. She used the talent to enter into the game. Yeah. We had a case of uh, a young lady called um, Patricia Chaze, yeah. where the mom had done great things and built up a good ent em enterprise. And she said, I'll take over from there and make it even bigger. We had a case of Agase Kalala Jr., who also said, Daddy, you've done a great job. Can I make it bigger from here onwards? the avenues and the routes going into business are numerous. Remember the case of Ebenezer Chimba? Absolutely. A mm -hmm. man was working somewhere and says, I'm going to abandon an overseas job and go and start and formalize in a big scale the laboratory sector. The message is clear. No matter where you are, no matter your circumstances, what we are driving to communicate to the Ugandans is, even if you are like Lenga Jun Ijino, you are like the other fellow or lawyer of Amuru, you can start wherever you are mm -hmm. and with whatever you have to make it in business and do a big job. Thank you, Charles. It. On that note, viewers, we've come to the end of this week's show. This makes it for us. Join us again next Sunday for yet another riveting edition of the show. I've been your host, Charles Boji. Have a good evening. God bless. Bye-bye.